Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Jennifer Puentes, and I just wanted to introduce Rhonda Fritz and Karen Gomez, um, talk a little bit about some of their research that they've done together. Rhonda Fritz is an associate professor of education specializing in elementary education and early literacy. Prior to coming to EOU, Rhonda was a K-12 through teacher for 19 years. She taught kindergarten, Title I reading, middle school language, arts, fourth and fifth grade, and ended her K-12 through teaching as a reading specialist, uh, where she discovered a passion for improving outcomes for struggling readers. The passion led her to uh, uh, university. Maybe she should have helped me a little bit there. Um, <laughs> hear me this in here. Just yeah, there you go. Um, her passion, of course, uh, to help students who are struggling with reading uh, led her to University of Oregon Special Education Department, where she received her PhD in 2016. Uh, her research interests include prevention and intervention of reading difficulties, teacher preparation, and the link between behavior and academic outcomes. Rhonda's looking forward to her sabbatical year um, in which she plans to investigate possibilities for implementing literacy clinic that will train teachers in practices for liter literacy intervention while serving children and families in our region. Karen Gomez uh, grew up in Pacific Northwest and completed her undergraduate degree at Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma, Washington. Prior to her experience in higher education, she taught elementary level uh, for 18 years in a variety of public and private schools in Washington and Texas. Karen earned her degree, her doctorate, at Texas A&M University of Commerce in 20, uh, 2005. She was eager to return to the Pacific Northwest after several years of living in Texas, happily accepted the position as a faculty member at EOU in 2006. Uh, she's currently an associate professor in the College of Education. Her research interests and presentations include literacy and teacher education. She was an editorial assistant for the Journal of Literacy Research during her graduate studies and served on the editorial board for the publication for several years. She has taught in undergraduate and graduate teacher preparation programs as well as a Master of Science program while at EOU. She's also spent seven years um, as the director of the education, edu educator preparation uh, for the College of Education. In 2017, she took a one year leave of absence uh, from EOU to return to the elementary school classroom. Uh, she used this opportunity to refresh her elementary teaching skills and gain new perspectives to bring to the teacher preparation program at EOU. She worked in a dual language international school in Mexico. She and her Spanish co-teacher shared a sixth grade classroom. Um, in addition to her teaching duties, Karen was uh, the Director of Professional Development for teaching faculty and led in the school's effort to submit preliminary accreditation application. Karen returned to EOU in the fall of 2018 to resume her faculty position and has been teaching full-time in the undergraduate teacher preparation program and the Master's of Science program since that time. All right, I'll go ahead and turn it over. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for um, risking your health and well-being you know, due to the COVID-19 or COVID uh, outbreak. So thank you so much for coming. We are going to have a conversation about some research that we have been working on together um, about international teaching experience for our teacher prep candidates. Um, because of the fact that I had the opportunity to teach at elementary school in Mexico for one year, it was an opportunity for me to be able to bring students down there also from EOU to have an opportunity to teach within classrooms or at least observe within classrooms in that international setting. So that was really the impetus for the research that we're about to present. And then I hooked Rhonda into presenting or to helping with the pr presentation of the research because she was helping with um, all of the interviewing that we were doing um, I help, had her working with me on the interview, and so she's really been a great help in help in understanding what this research is doing, what direction we need to go with it, and her insights have been really helpful. So we're working on this project together, and it is, I want to stress, a project in process right now. So um, as you know, <laughs> EOU's main campus is a rural, regional, and a rural institution, and we are a regional institution. Although we have sites um, in Gresham, and Pendleton, Hermiston, and in Ontario, the main campus is here, and many of our students from this area have some limited exposure to um, 
cultural and linguistic diversity if they haven't left this area much or haven't spent much time outside of this area. And because the College of Education has a commitment to developing culturally responsive practices in our teacher candidates, we felt that an international experience for some students who may have had less exposure than others, this would be a great opportunity for them to experience that kind of diversity in their lives and have perspectives that they could bring back with them from that experience. So uh, when I first proposed this research and started working on it, I wanted to develop an international clinical experience because I, we had the opportunity. It was there. I was able to be in that school and have candidates with me and be with them, supervising them and working with them through that process. So it began as an open door that I decided to take advantage of that opportunity. Um, and so be, uh, because we had that, I felt that I could develop that international clinical experience opportunity to encourage the kind of cultural awareness and responsive practices that we wanted them to be able to develop as candidates. So that was the opportunity. The purpose was to broaden the candidate experience with culturally and linguistically diverse students. At the international school where I was working and where I brought candidates, we had Spanish-speaking students, we had English-speaking students, German-speaking students, um, and we had a couple of students who spoke French, and then another student who was um, from an indigenous group there in Mexico, and her home language is, was not Spanish or English, but it was the indigenous language. So we had the opportunity for our students to interact um, with students at the school with multiple languages, although the instruction was only in English and in Spanish. So I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about, oh, sorry. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the literature that we found, because as you know, if you're not the principal investigator, then you get to do the lit review. <laughs> so guess what I got to do. Um, so anyway, um, so some of the things that we found is that, that there's definitely a need for cult cultural responsiveness um, in our classrooms and with our teachers. So one thing that we've found and that we've known is that diversity is increasing in our schools, while at the same time, our um, teacher population is maintaining at white women. Um, so we don't have people teaching that are representative of the children in our schools. So um, we know that teacher effectiveness has everything to do with their knowledge and skills around cu cultural responsiveness, but that they maybe not are not always getting the opportunities that they need to, to develop that. Um, so we know that for many of our teachers that are in practice right now, those skills are, are weak. Um, so with that in mind, um, we also started to look at what, what the literature was saying about teacher prep programs, and teacher prep programs are um, also generally weak in that area. That's what researchers have found. And, but, our, but the standards that we have to adhere to have high levels of standards for us um, in terms of what we need to, to provide our students for experiences. And uh, Tanya has done a great job with our ESOL program providing many of those experiences for our students. Um, the things that they, we are required to include are um, them discovering their own cultural identities, so just themselves figuring out what their cultural identity is, and examining their beliefs about culture, as well as um, learning about other cultures. And um, lastly, and, most, and very importantly, the sociocultural aspects of teaching and learning. What, what does, how does culture impact the way we teach and the way students learn? Uh, so what does that mean for teaching in particular? When you just look at responsive teaching, that means that we read our students, we understand what they need, and we adapt our instruction to match what our students need. So when we talk about cultural responsiveness, um, that means that we really understand the cultural patterns that are within our student population and how they, that influences our student behavior, it influences the way they learn, the way they interact with other people. And that we also um, know that cultural responsiveness means that the teacher is fully aware of the home and community culture and they are able to apply that and use that to enhance learning experiences for their students. Um, is this still me? Yes. Okay, so some of the research has also looked at what does it mean to be a competent, um, culturally responsive teacher? And these are some of the things that they found. So 
Um, it includes three major topics, curriculum and instruction, which they included assessment in that, um, relationship and exp expectation establishment, and then um, group belonging formation. So I'll talk a little bit about each of those. For the curriculum and instruction, they were clear to say that you need to include that before, during, and after instruction. So before instruction, we need to be evaluating students and figuring out what their needs are, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and how they learn. That's what we do before we ever start teaching. And then during instruction, we should be continually assessing what we're doing to make sure that it is meeting the needs and in a culturally responsive way. And then afterward, that making sure that our assessments to see if they've learned are also culturally responsive. So throughout the entire instructional process and cycle, we have to be aware of that cultural responsiveness. As far as relationships, um, communication with parents and families is huge, as well as making sure that we have high expectations for the success of these students. Um, so those interpersonal relationships are, are highly important. Now, when I started looking at this, I thought, these are all important for all students. I think that the difference is we have, how that happens depends on the culture of those, of those children and the people in our, in our schools. Um, the last little piece, group belonging formation, is how we establish a classroom culture and how we make it a safe, welcoming environment for all students and considering their culture in that process. Uh, we want to make sure that we have really positive relationships with kids and also that we, um, we provide them the knowledge and skills to be successful in the mainstream culture. So those are all pieces that are important to make sure that kids are successful in schools. One possible method for doing this is an international experience. Like I said, Tanya already does a fantastic job with what we do in our ESOL program, um, but could this international experience even add and add to that experience? So um, the, re the research says that it can have positive effects if it has the right elements in it. So it has to have some cultural mentoring so that the students have some idea of what to expect, which includes provision of cultural content. So they know what they're walking into and how they can be successful and um, be respectful in those cultures, as well as opportunities to reflect on their experiences throughout, throughout the experience. Um, and lastly, and most importantly, and we'll talk about how this, how this sort of uh, rolled out with our, with our students, they need to have real engagement with the culture. It can't be that they're in a hotel by a hotel pool and just because they're in another country, they're not experiencing the culture. So it has to be real engagement with the culture. Um, we know that if they have these experiences, it may increase their understanding of that connection between culture and um, how that affects teaching and learning. And it can help them to be more aware of not just the needs of the people from that culture, but also the gifts they can bring to our classroom. And I think that's an important piece that we're not just talking about how their needs are different, but they bring some great gifts that we need to capitalize on in our classrooms. And lastly, they can become more accepting of those who are different from themselves. And I just want to say she did volunteer to do the literature review, just putting that out there. <laughs> um, and, and as we continue on and talk through some of the results we have from the interviews we did with our candidates, you're going to find multiple connections to the research that has been um, supporting this process. Um, we chose to use a definition of cultural and linguistic responsiveness um, as our framework, and that comes from Shiroki Holly. Um, from his text, Cultural and Linguistically Responsive Teaching and Learning. And this is the definition that we used as our framework. The validation and affirmation of the home, indigenous culture, and home language for the purposes of building and bridging the student to success in the culture of academia and mainstream society. And in the second edition of this text by um, Holly, he really focuses in on the terms validation, affirmation, building, and bridging. And so um, he uses the acronym VAB, that we need to VAB with our students. Um, and so the validation, affirmation, building, and 
um, bridging are the, the big ideas from this definition. And we use this definition as our framework, and we also used it some with our students. Um, and that we were trying to help them see how this, their experience might connect with this framework of cultural and linguistic responsiveness. So when we began this research process, because we were, I was going to be able to have these students in an international setting, I wanted to know how does that international clinical experience influence a teacher candidate's perspective on culturally and linguistically responsive practices. And as a follow-up, how does an international clinical experience influence instructional decisions and actions? This is, as I said earlier, a process. Um, we are in process with this research, and we're in process of looking at that second question, how does an international clinical experience influence instructional decisions and actions? Because that needs to be what happens after they come back um, in terms of understanding what application they've been able to make from that experience. So the setting of the school, um, it's an international private dual language elementary school in Mexico. It does go through secundaria, through ninth grade, um, but I have focused specifically on the elementary setting. Um, the language of instruction was Spanish um, for half the day and English for half the day or half time English, half time Spanish. We did it day by day. So one day they would have me as their English teacher. The next day they would have the Spanish teacher as their Spanish teacher. And we taught all subjects we, in that elementary self-contained setting. Uh, where we divided the standards that were to be taught in that term and we created project-based um, learning for these students and the, the projects that I taught were taught in English, integrated subjects, and then the subjects that my co-teacher Laura taught were um, the problem-based learning projects that she did were all taught in Spanish and also integrated across multiple subjects. Um, Population of the school was approximately 50-50 split of children who had been born in Mexico and um, students who were coming from international areas. I will say that the international students were generally children of expats who were now living in Mexico. The school was started originally from some Canadian and American expats who had school-aged children and didn't know what to do with them down there, so they decided to start a school. So that's where it came from. Um, that's the origin of the school, and it has changed somewhat since then, but it is still approximately a 50-50 split between um, local children and children who are um, primarily English-speaking and come, families come from countries other than Mexico. The research participants over two school years, the fall of 2017 and, and um, so the school year 2017-18 and then school year 2018-19, we had seven undergraduates who went to the school and in the fall term they did their beginning um, practicum, which is a three week, 15 day full time experience in the schools. And the purpose of that experience is to learn what it is to set up a classroom um, for students on the first day, greet students, learn how to start that learning environment within the classroom. And all of our students do that practicum. It's just that some students did it in Mexico as opposed to doing it here. Um, we did have one graduate student who did her student teaching there, which meant she arrived in January, and she stayed there all the way until June. So she had a very lengthy experience as opposed to the three-week experience. And she did her full-time student teaching in two different grade levels. As the English-speaking teacher, she would teach second grade one day and third grade the next, and back to second grade and back to third grade. So that was the setting. We did have two more students who went down, undergraduate students who went down for a three-week experience this fall, the fall of 2019-20 school year, but they're not included in this because they're, we have not collected data from them in terms of interviews because we're in the process of making some changes to the research. So we have two more participants who are not um, going to be, their, their data won't show up in our research today. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, the data collection piece because this is kind of where I stepped in. What happened is because Karin was down there with the students, we thought it was best that the interviews happened from someone else who was removed from that situation. So I got to do uh, the interviews. So um, Karin and I worked together via, uh, it wasn't Zoom, Google Hangouts at that point, yeah, creating our interview questions. So we asked them things like, um, just tell us about your experiences. We left an open-ended question like that. We asked what did they think were the advantages and disadvantages of being in this international placement. We asked how, um, 
they thought it would impact their future teaching, and if they thought the, um, and we asked them some questions about whether they thought they had developed cu cultural responsiveness in their teaching practices. So um, after we had done that, then we came, we tried it, an attempt at coding, and uh, qualitative is not my forte, so this was a great opportunity for me to learn that process of qualitative research. So. Um, Karn was really helpful in teaching me this first round of coding. So with the first round, we, we did in vivo coding. I had no idea that's what it was called. But um, it's semi-structured. It's a way we went through each of the interviews and we looked for patterns across the different interviews. Were they saying things that were similar and um, looking for some themes to come out of that. But what we we struggled with that, um, and we struggled with finding those themes, and really didn't, it wasn't very clear. So with that, Karin um, has, has developed us, or has moved us into a second round of coding. So do you wanna talk about that part? The process with the in vivo coding, trying to use the candidate's own words, we were struggling to find that clarity because it was kind of all over the map. So I went back and I decided that we would try descriptive coding, which is a, a larger piece where you're trying to look for ideas as opposed to pulling out individual words and phrases from the, from the candidates. And through a descriptive coding process, I feel like we were able to get closer to some clarity as to what we were finding from our candidates. Um, and it was a difficult process because we had these different experiences. We had these students who had done a three week, their undergraduates is their very first class in the ed program. And then we bring in a graduate student who is um, in her student teaching experience. And so we were finding that that was a little bit difficult. So we, we narrowed down and we were working, focusing then just on our undergraduate students for this um, presentation. And so the, um, even with that, the in vivo coding was, was not coming to clarity. So with descriptive coding, I found that I had multiple codes that I found initially, a lot of the students talked about wanting to travel and that's why they did this when they were asked about why they made the decision to go on this, on this, um, this international experience. And they were talking about learning flexibility while they were there because things were really different. My classroom was still being built on Friday and classes started on Monday. Um, they were, they were putting the mosaic in the floor and trying to figure out what they were going to do for the windows and things like that. So it was a little different experience for them and they learned flexibility. Um, and what, it's Sunday and the desks have come in. I guess we better go to school on Sunday so we have the desks ready for Monday. Um, so they were, they, that was a big idea that they came up with, but that flexibility actually morphed into some other things when, they, when I refined these codes. They talked a little bit about understanding their privilege, um, recognizing either economic privilege or their, um, the fact that they were Americans in this town was kind of a big deal for them. This was the town that we were in is a tourist town. And so the economy runs largely off of tourism. Um, and as an example of that, my one of most of my students recognized that that um, economic privilege of being American and coming with dollars was a pretty big deal down there. And it was really apparent in the fact that we could not get the homestays that we wanted for our students when they were there. We had some of our students who did literally stay in an Airbnb because the families that we wanted them to be able to stay with, the local families, did not have space in their home for an extra person to stay. And even though they, there was a, a, some financial incentive, there was a $400 fee that we charged the students and that entire $400 went to the families that would have the students stay with them. They didn't have a space for them. One student who had a fantastic experience down there lived with a family that literally built a cinder block room on the outside of their house with the $400 they received and created room for her to live in and then she could hang out with the family and had a really fantastic homestay, but she was the only one that had an authentic homestay while we were there. Um, so these were some of the big, the bigger um, ticket items in terms of descriptive codings, the ones that came up, codes that came up most often. And then I refined those codes to find some emerging ideas. This analysis is still in process. I need to go back through and, and reconfigure some of the things that were, that I found originally, but this is where we are right now. Um, it, 
in the emerging ideas, when I combined codes and refined the ideas and pulled the quotations out, we found these bigger ideas. Validation of home language and home culture, where our candidates were really validating what they were seeing in terms of language and culture down there and valuing that. Um, their own recognition of, of their own privilege um, as who they were in that space. They were discovering, somewhat to their surprise, that there were similarities between people there and people here, um, and kids there and kids here. Uh, I also found where I could see that they had blind spots in their understanding of their of, of cultural responsiveness or their own understanding of where they think they're really valuing something that they're seeing, but not really. Um, so that was an interesting thing for me to find. And then many of the comments came out with a, where it showed a perceived superiority of the U.S. schools over the school they were in. So those were some of the bigger ideas. And so I'm going to take each of those and give you, <laughs> these are kind of long quotes, um, but I wanted you to hear the words of, this, of the candidates as they talked about these things and as they were put into these larger ideas in my analysis. So for validation of home language and culture, they have the honoring the flag ceremony in the Mexican school. They do it only once a week, and it's like a really big ceremony. The school gets out around the basketball court, and they march the flag around, and it's just very solemn and very serious time. I think that that's really cool to see how much they really value the love of the country, and they want to try to instill that. So I think that's really important. Um, you're going to have that student that's from somewhere you've never heard of, and you don't know the culture, and you don't know what it's like there, but you need to. Like if you're going to make personal connections for students and give background information and relate it to their lives and you know, know nothing about their lives, how can you do that? And then another idea is recognition of privilege. These quotes, I think, show, share that. I think I see how privileged we are here in the States. You know, we have access to printers and I'm just being able to easily buy things for the classroom. It was sort of like checking my privilege as somebody who has been in a school where, where we had things. I, was just, I think it was just a matter of getting that new perspective. And then the similarities kind of cracked me up. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of families in the states that have a similar situation where the parents don't speak English. Some students came from privileged families, some didn't, and I feel like that's going to happen no matter where you are. Kids are the same everywhere, and I think that's kind of cool to see. Even though you're in Mexico, even though we're here in the United States, kids are kids. They just want to play. They want to have fun. And then there were a couple of things that I thought were interesting in terms of blind spots. This person said, their day was structured way different than what I'm used to. See, I worked at the school here as an aide, so I'm pretty familiar with the structure of schools here, here meaning the U.S., currently. And so when we went down there, it was just like, wait, what? They had lunch at 10.30, which I thought was early and strange. And so this person was not recognizing the cultural part of that, that the kids, most of the kids in this particular place would come to school and they wouldn't have had breakfast yet because they eat a later breakfast and then in this particular community after school is when they would have that middle meal, what we would call lunch, and then dinner is pretty late, like seven, eight, nine o'clock at night. And so 10.30 is when the school started serving lunch because that was about the time kids needed to eat. But the fact that this, this person put the emphasis on that was really strange, um, was just a lack of recognition of what was, what was happening in that, in that space. Um, another one. A lot of the children in the first grade class are Spanish only speaking, so those kids, I feel, were trying to push it harder to see how much they, were, they could get away with because they were like, I don't know what you're saying. I can't behave. And so there was a little bit of a blind spot there in, in understanding kids and, and understanding perspective from where they were um, and making some decisions about what they thought children were doing and why. Um, perceived superior, superiority of U.S. schools. I don't know what the first week of school was like for U.S. teachers. I know that what the training was like in Mexico, which was probably non-standard for what happens in most of the U.S. schools. Oh, we don't have desks delivered yet. It's probably not a problem that is faced in the U.S. How things were done there, I can't really transfer over to the U.S. as much. Things I learned in my first 15 days practicum are not things I will be doing in the U.S. usually, including professionality, just like what you wear to school, how school works. Like, it's way different. And I felt like I did not get as much as, like, the people who are here in the U.S. doing their 15 days. So those were the, the um, ideas that are coming out. But there are more quotes and more things that to look at. So this is a first pass. There's more to do. So really, we felt like 
what we gathered didn't really answer the research questions that we were trying to answer. We really, it wasn't clear if we had impacted their uh, cultural and linguistic response, responsivity, and it wasn't really clear um, what we needed to do to make sure that happened for students. Um, we didn't really know that we couldn't tell if it was going to impact their instructional decisions later on. So that was a, a big conundrum for us and trying to figure out, well, what are we going to do with this now? What do we do next? Um, just trying to figure out what's, what's missing. So what is missing from the experience? What do we need to ramp up to make sure that they are um, learning what we want them to learn? Or maybe it's we need to really reconsider what our outcomes are. What do we want them to get? What should we expect them to get from, especially when it's just that 15-day experience? So I think that's some of the things that um, we really need to think about as we move forward. So in trying to figure out what, if any, um, difference has this experience made for them, I've done one follow-up interview um, just recently, and so I haven't had time to do all the, the thinking about that that I want to do. But I decided to start with a person who had the longest experience there. I figured if there was going to be a difference, it would probably be with the person who was there from January to June, as opposed to the kids that were there for 15 days, or the, uh, excuse me, adults who were there for 15 days. Um, I'm still older than all of them, so I guess I can use the word kids. <laughs> So I did a follow-up um, interview with one of the participants, and in my unfinished analysis, I haven't, even, I haven't even coded this. I've just pulled some ideas out that I, I got from that interview. And I think they're pretty telling. And one of the most important things that I think we got out of that is the placement school was not necessarily reflective of the local culture. She talked a lot about the haves and the have-nots and how easy it was to see that in that school, and the haves were the people who were the expats, um, and because they were the millionaires that started the school. So there was that issue. Um, this person did not make a connection between working with linguistically and culturally diverse kids in Mexico and applying culturally responsive practices in the US classroom. When I asked her what she took from that experience in terms of her practice or what, what she felt she learned, she kind of had a, mm, I, don't, I don't really think I took anything, which was a sad thing to hear. Um, <laughs> But she did talk about, when I, I asked, well, what about working there with those kids? What, was, what, um, what did you learn or what had you learned prior to working with those kids? And she really focused on her ESOL coursework. And that made a big difference for her in terms of how that helped her provide the learning support she needed to to students in Mexico. And when I asked her about bringing that here, she said, eh, I, don't really have, I, don't, I don't have any kids in my classroom that speak other languages. And so she didn't see it as relevant at that point for her. And when I pushed on that a little bit more, she said, well, I think I might, it might be hard for me to remember to use those kinds of practices if somebody doesn't look like they're linguistically diverse. So looking at somebody who, who doesn't look like they might speak a different language, she might have a harder time remembering to apply those skills um, in that setting. She also made a uh, comment about how the coursework that she was doing while she was down there, because she was still in our program, so she was taking coursework and student teaching, and the coursework was, our, and I quote, hours and hours and hours every day of homework that she had to do, that that um, hampered her ability to connect with the co community, to do the kinds of things she'd like to do, to travel outside of anywhere but that little village that we were living in. Um, so she felt that it made it difficult for her to have a rich cultural experience and have some community involvement. Um, she did say that if there was an expectation of some kind of community engagement, that that was what, if, if she had to do some kind of a community engagement experience, she felt that would have helped her too, but there wasn't time with what she was doing. Um, and then the tourist feel of the town made it more difficult to experience the culture of the Mexican-born local population in the sense that there were so many people who were in and out of the town and living there who were not from the area, it was hard for her to really identify what it felt like um, for the people who had been there. One of the projects, um, as, an aside here, one of the projects I did with my sixth graders early on in the year is we were learning the history of the town and so their responsibility was to go out and interview 
um, somebody who had lived in the town for more than 30 years. So a lot of them went and talked to their grandparents or the shop owners or whatever. And they were, we did a comparison contrast between what it was like 30 years ago and what it's like now. And it was hugely different. And one of the biggest issues is the Airbnbs and the Verbos and the others that have come in, they've purchased the properties and grown and expanded and made new properties. And those are too expensive for um, the, the folks to live in because they're being rented out. I had, literally, I have a student from my sixth grade classroom who partway through the year, was their family was priced out of their rental home that they were living in. Dad went out into the jungle with a machete, cleared a space, and built a cinder block room that that family then lived in for the rest of the school year because of the economics of the town. So the tourist feel made it very difficult for her to, for our student teacher to understand really the culture of the, what that culture might have been at some point, and it wasn't anymore. So. so as we move forward with this project, we, we realized in the middle of the interviews that we probably needed to revise our, our questions and um, ask some different questions that would perhaps get to what we were trying to find out a little bit better. Um, so we also thought the research questions themselves may not be the right questions. Like I was saying earlier, maybe we're looking for the wrong outcomes for an experience like this. So maybe our research questions need to be revised to reflect that. And then we also wanted to make sure, based on that, the literature that said um, the different elements, make sure we're providing those elements before they go on the, the experience, while they're there, and then after they get back. And lastly, the, the thing that we would like to do is find a good tool, an instrument to measure cultural responsiveness prior to their experience, and not just do it with the students who get to go on this international experience, but see what is happening with our students that are here and at the different sites, and see if there is any value added by this cultural experience or this international experience. So those are kind of the things that we're trying to put our finger on and figure out how to do going forward. Okay. Rhonda's already discussed the focused outcomes for the experience. One of the other things I, I really feel like we need to do is identify appropriate placements, international placements. Um, schools where our candidates would have an opportunity to um, learn more about the local culture, um, to learn more about um, Language, our students were obviously were English speaking. They did not need to be bilingual to be down there. And the students who did have a little bit of Spanish used a little bit of it, but um, they didn't have to because the school administration was English speaking. Faculty meetings were often in English. So they didn't get the experience and they didn't live with, with families, host families. So they didn't get the language experience we would have wanted for them. So finding appropriate international placements is, is a, a consideration. We also want to, as Rhonda said, identify an assessment to measure growth and cultural responsiveness. And there's one that we're looking at. Do you remember? I, did you bring it with you? It's on a slide somewhere. <laughs> but we found one that is specifically aimed not at, at teachers, not just at cultural responsiveness in general. So we, we have an instrument that we're going to look at. Um, one of the things that is a concern about international placement is that our students don't have the money to just go abroad. Even this trip, which was as cheap as it gets, they paid for their airfare, they paid a $400 fee, which was their housing and one meal every day of their three weeks that they were there. They only had to pay for two meals a day and they got free lunch every day and even on the weekends, their, whoever was hosting them would make sure they got a free meal. So it was two meals a day and whatever spending money they wanted. So it was, a cheap experience and even with that it was a struggle for some of our students to go so there isn't a fair way um, to say well we should just all make them they should all go because that isn't it isn't feasible financially and for some people it's it's family issues make it not possible to do that so I think there are a lot of reasons why students can't or don't go on international experiences so for one of those issues, it might be a funding issue. Can we find some way to fund that for students who really can and would like to go? Um, but the question mark at the end is, you know, international experience is great for those students who go. 
but how can we reap the benefits of that opportunity and share that with others? And if others can't go, how can we work with the students who have been able to go to, to spread the wealth, share the wealth of what they've learned? And so international travel is great, but I'm a little concerned about saying that is the way to do this. And I do want to say that I, I think our students do, because our college is really focused on this, I, I think our students, particularly our undergrads, do get a really good experience in learning these concepts and understanding this through our through programs that we have in place. So I think that all of our students are able to gain some learning, gain understanding and learn this. The travel abroad is a, an added benefit, I guess. Okay. So, and I didn't get all your references. Sorry, I started and I forgot to get yours. <laughs> so there we go. And so at this point, I guess we're opening it up for any questions you may have. Tanya. You talked about perhaps changing your questions um, and what you were looking for, and I'm curious to know more about that. So what, what changed and what changes are you looking at? The question was really looking at application of that experience here and with with what we've done so far, we can't see that, but there's one of the, we can't see that because we haven't had the opportunity to do all the follow-up interviews, and they all have such different experiences when they come back. They're not all here. They're in a lot of different places. So I think as opposed to looking at, let's follow them and see how it goes over the next few years, which is my original plan, let's see what they can bring back with them to apply to what they're doing right now in practicum. I think I, it might have been too broad, too grand of an idea of what we could get out of them, but we haven't narrowed specifically. We're really looking at more of a, a focusing in, in on what what's realistic and what can we do because cultural responsiveness is not a I have it today and I didn't have it yesterday, or I I'm going to get it in three weeks. It's it's a it's a process, and I think one of the things I'd like to look at is more of their own. The pr before they go, understanding their own identities and understanding who they are before they go somewhere else. And in the interview, I did a follow-up interview with the candidate, with the, the person who's now teaching um, the graduate student. She suggested that maybe they go into the experience with some questions that they then try to answer while they're there. So now it would be what kinds of questions. So do you have more insight on that? <laughs> nope. we're, we're still the, we're, we're working on it, but more of helping them see themselves before they go, understanding who they are, and then going into that experience, and then asking more about what does that mean for them in their experiences that they have now, not in the future, far in the future. And I think um, something of what you've done is you still have found, you might not have found what you were intending to as qualitative research others, um, <laughs> but one way we can think about the work that you have is to have some kind of research that is close enough to this that even if there's like something in common in it, it's where they can either say or whatever the important thing that you say about the different cultures, and it might just be a replication of your questions in your interview and not something where you're going to feed your thesis on, even if you're not pinpointing who would do that to you, but if you just want whatever those fears or concerns are with the different culture. Um, I also think that what you were saying about that student feel, um, well, maybe that wasn't what you were looking for. That's also a product of gentrification. Yes. yes. Yes, it's, 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 it's an important, important comment. I, I didn't want to, yeah. that's why I wanted it there to say, this is an important finding. It's not part of our question, original question, but it's a really important finding. Yeah, I think there's something for them learning with that, even though it's not what they were thinking or wanting to have that cultural response. It's like, we want to live in these communities and have to be able to tourism and you know, what it kind of toll it takes. So. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning of your presentation, you referenced um, that you were working with the standards for the different grade levels. So I'm curious what standards you were using. The Common Core State standards or standards from Mexico or? Yeah, uh, we were using standards from SEP, which is the Mexican education system, the federal education system. And, and the year that I was teaching there, we had um, six week terms. Here are all the standards you need to teach in all the subjects in this six weeks. 
and then the next six weeks, the next six weeks. So we were using the Mexican standards, but because our students need to be familiar with Common Core standards, I was having them, the, my student teacher, the, the people at the beginning weren't teaching. They were, that's an introductory experience. They weren't teaching lessons yet. But my student teacher, she had to crosswalk with the Mexican standards what Common Core standard that would meet or what Oregon standard that would meet because she, an ex expectation from TSPC for international experiences is they have to be able to demonstrate that they know Oregon standards. So she was crosswalking every lesson that she taught. And actually, I think this, the standards you're referring to and what I was talking about in the slides are the standards that TSPC puts on us as a teacher preparation program, what we have to include in terms of uh, training our teachers. Just kind of chronic problem solver here. Um, so was... Could this be done in place of the volunteer stuff that we require pre, um, pre class? Would that free you up so you're not trying to do two things at the same time? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, they they are required to do 30 hours prior to admission to our program, and they can volunteer in any classroom. And it's possible that they could do that. This could be that 30 hours, but then they would also still need to have this practicum, this structured practicum experience somewhere else if they didn't do it there. I was just thinking that, you know, the, the mention that, you know, the pile of work that they were under where they couldn't get out and do anything. I'm just thinking maybe that trying to cram two things at the same time was, you know. Right. And that that's definitely an issue with our master's program because mm -hmm. it's such an intense program course wise yeah. in addition to student teaching. So I think we we learned from that that that's really what that wasn't a really good place to have them doing student teaching because of the rigors of that program in particular. The other the other students doing that 15 day experience were our undergrads and they didn't have any other coursework well, responsibilities. One thought I'd had is if you know since it if you if you did this in the place of the volunteer work maybe you could do it as not even in a school you could bring them down and have them you know do some kind of uh, clean up construction work on an orphanage or you know some kind of volunteer work down there and that would probably get them a little bit more indigenous uh, experience too, right? Yeah, I agree that would definitely be um, a really good way for them to really see the culture uh -huh. and understand the culture. Our 30 hour volunteer experience is really to get them in the classroom to decide, do you really wanna do this? So that the purpose of that is a little bit different in that way. And one of the things I wanted to add in here about this experience is the fact that I was a faculty member who could be there with them was, I think, really helpful in the sense that um, there weren't students out somewhere that weren't part of an organized faculty-led or pro program-led um, ex experience. Um, and when I was talking earlier about appropriate international experience sites to go, one of the other issues that I didn't remember to mention on there is that when I taught there, I was half English, half Spanish, but the school over time has morphed. And so the school that we have been in in the past, I don't think is gonna be the best placement in the future because now they have an English speaking teacher who goes in just for an hour or two a day and teaches English language arts. And that's all they teach. They don't teach the multiple subjects. And in our elementary program, students need to teach multiple subjects. And to, for TSB to accept student teaching anyway, they have to teach in English. So that school is not going to be a good placement school for us. So the trick is, is there another place to do that? There may be, but we just, we have to explore that. In the preparation for the students before they went to Mexico, was there an expectation that they ha would have done some coursework related to difference power and discrimination? The students who went are all at least they're at least juniors because they've been accepted into programs. They would have done the DPD work for the most part. You know, they would have taken DPD credit probably through um, their Gen Ed coursework. But and the meetings that we had with them prior to going down, I had with them had to do with we did a lot with um, understanding 
what the school was going to be like, what it what it is, the, what the town was like. We didn't, but we didn't do a lot of cultural exploration and DPD kind of work prior. So that's why we're saying we need to do some pre work before they go down to make it that valuable for them. So they would have had some general DPD coursework, but nothing targeted, and it was. And since they may have all taken different things, it's not something we discussed as a group before we went. But that's a really good starting point. Thank you for that thought. Well, thank you, and I'm sure people can hang out for a couple minutes if you want to ask questions or talk a little bit more, but thank you everyone for braving nature and coming out today.